This is episode number 260 of the Inner Fight Podcast. Inner Talks 13 with David LaBouchere. Thanks a lot to Smith Street Polo, the sponsors of the Inner Fight Podcast and also of Inner Talks. Remember guys, if you hop over to iTunes, rate the podcast, leave a review, Smith Street Polo will send you a goodie bag of treats. Definitely worth doing. Here we go. This is Inner Talks number 13. Let's see what David has to say. Enjoy the show. So good morning and welcome to another Inner Talks. Obviously, I want to thank you all for taking the time to be here. We will start on time. Three minutes after the time improvised. Very good. We'll also finish on time. The format for this morning is David's obviously going to speak for a while and then we're going to have some questions before we wrap up at nine o'clock. I want to thank my wife's company, Smith Street Paleo, for dishing up all these, she's got a mouthful of balls, dishing up all these balls nice and early in the morning for you. Please feel free to have some after, talk to her about that. If you really like them, you can speak to someone downstairs and buy some on the way out. You don't have to do that. I think when I was thinking about the talk today, there's a lot of noise in the world at the moment about hard work. And I think we all realize that if we want to get things, we need to work very hard. And that comes in all different shapes and sizes. And I think that's, well, if you follow me in my Instagram, you probably know that. And that's what I think. And everyone knows that hard work gets you good results. I think another really important component to success is vision. And we see it a lot in companies where they'll communicate their vision to us. But I think sometimes as individuals, that vision can be lacking. What you want to become, what you want to achieve, what's going to happen in the longer term. And what ends up happening is, because we don't know what that vision is, and we don't know where we're going to get to, or what we want to become, it makes the hard work even harder. So when I got through David's bio for the talk, about six pages worth, I had to condense into a small poster. And it said towards the end that his goal, which he's obviously hopefully going to speak about, is in 2047. I was like, wow. What was quite funny is when we started to put the creative together and send it out there, I put it on my Instagram story to start with. Five people messaged me and go, mate, you've made a typo. It's supposed to be 2017. I was like, I went back to his six pages of bio. I was like, no, it says there, 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 and there, 2047. And that's what sort of got me thinking about this whole thing about vision. The topic's amazing as well, energy. I won't ruin any more of it, but I just want you to think about those two things as you go through this talk and for the rest of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together. David Lubbershire. Thank you very much. A bullet travels approximately out of a high-velocity rifle about six to seven hundred meters every second. It's got a huge amount of energy. I come from a military background, and a lot of what I'll talk about today will call on my experience as an army officer before I came to this second life in Dubai. I'm not completely proud about everything that went on in those 32 years, but I will mention them. And some of what I say is a product of history, and I can't excuse it. And some of what I say will not be for younger ears, and at that point I will tell those that have younger people here, that this is potentially upsetting. But I'm here today to talk to you about energy and the art of the possible. This was me. I served all over the world. I served in every operational theater that the army has been to in the last 30 or so years. I was a leadership expert. I wrote a lot of leadership and I taught a lot of leadership. And there are those that say 
that those that can't teach. I taught a lot of leadership, but at the same time, I hope I did some of it. I also advised as a senior planner in number 10 Downing Street for two prime ministers in 2007 through to 2010, shortly before I came here. But reality wasn't actually all about good service. Reality of the first 10 years was alcoholism and 70 cigarettes a day. So I wasn't a very healthy person and I wasn't a very good person and I spent my time inebriated waiting for the Russians in Germany on tax-free booze. We even put vodka in the windscreen washers because it was better and cheaper than using antifreeze. So I very occasionally drank water, but otherwise I was on champagne by the middle of the afternoon. And it's the reason I joined the army, was to play polo and drink champagne. I told those that were recruiting that I wanted to serve my country. But at that time, I wanted to play polo and drink champagne and misbehave extensively. I went to Berlin as my first tour. And in Berlin, we managed 200 different restaurants on 200 consecutive nights. I didn't sober up between each restaurant, and nor did we do much work. We were waiting for the Russians, and the Russians were bigger than us, and we were going to lose. And we estimated we had three days to survive. My battle plan was to fight back from the border of Berlin to a favorite establishment called Le Pouf Pouf, which was a house of ill repute. I was going to die happy. Since then, I, I got married, and... Getting married meant that I changed my life. I changed my life because we wanted children. And under the previous regime, the chances of having children were much thinner. And then I started running marathons, and then I played a lot of rugby, but I was still quite a big bloke. And then got into this thing called triathlon in about 2009, and realized that I was reasonably good at it. Uh, qualified for the world championships four times, went three times, and my best time was in Kona in nine hours 56 at the age of 50. I'm now 53 and looking at the next age group, and it's the only sport in the world where you really wish to get older. Because there, all these 49-year-olds keep on coming into my age group and smashing me, which means that at 55, I'm going to have a really good year. That's 2018. And in 2023, I'm going to be the world champion of Ironman at the age of 60. Now, I mentioned before that I used to be a planner. I used to go into number 10 and talk to some very important people about the plans. So I've now got plans. And as was mentioned before, 2047 is not, is not a typo. It is the longer term plan. And it's a continuing plan because once I get to 2047, I intend to defend that world championship thereafter for as long as I can. Now, I will be 87 years old in 2047. I think that's about right. And I, no, 84. So after that, I've got to get to 87, which is the oldest it's ever been done. And this fellow is 85 at the moment. He's the current sort of, if he, if he completes this year in Kona, he's going to be the oldest ever. And I have a feeling by the time I get to 85, it'll be, there'll be somebody at 86 and 87. So I'm going to have to move that goal along to the right. Now there is a set of principles behind every soldier which are called the principles of war. And we go to war with these 10 principles, unless you're Russian. Any Russians here? If you're Russian, you have 11 principles. The 11th principle is annihilation. The idea being that you don't just destroy your enemy, you destroy your enemy, his country, his friends, his family, his tennis partners, everybody you can think of because then he won't come back. But we only have 10, and the first of those is selection and maintenance of the aim. And that's why we have goals. Now, we all came to Dubai with goals in mind. And for some of you, those are just dreams because you don't have a plan to get there. You just said, we're going to earn enough money to do this. That's not a plan. Planning means having detail for the first three, six, perhaps a year, three, six months or a year, and then having an outline the next two or three years, and then having a really good idea thereafter, which is why I've set these, these goals of 55, 60, and 80-something, depending on how old Lou's getting on at 103. 
Now, I'm 53 years old. I absolutely believe that I'm halfway. So I'm going to live to 106, unless I'm run over by a bus. But I'm going to live my life as if I'm going to get to 106. And I think that's a pretty healthy way to look at the future. This fellow's doing pretty well. He came out to Iraq. He's Prince Philip. He's married to our queen. At the age of 87, he was in Iraq with me. Pretty good going. He's on the front line, and it was a difficult time. He flew out there, and he spent three days talking to soldiers. I want to be like him. I'm not married to the queen, but like him. That was me in Iraq. That's me in Iraq, wandering around in a lovely open Land Rover, playing Lawrence of Arabia. Absolutely fantastic six months of my life. And this is a warrior armored vehicle. We got into some pretty big scrapes in Iraq, one of which was a full-on firefight in the city of Maizan. The enemy, the opposition, was a militia who were very well armed and had no rules, no rules of war. Of course, we have rules of engagement, rules of war that we have to apply. And everybody's got a camera, so if you go outside those rules of war, then you will be video doing it, and you will end up in The Hague and go to jail if you're lucky enough to survive. There was a big firefight, and the attack got pretty bloody. And this is the commander exiting at high speed after the vehicle's been hit and getting out of there as fast as he can. In the next vehicle, and I'm probably from here, I keep, I, it goes shorter as my memory and this story gets better. He was really close to me, probably at the doors, in fact, quite a long way away. But I'm watching what is going on as a sniper fired one of those high-velocity bullets. And the commander was sitting up in his turret just at the top. And the bullet passed through his hand, passed through the weapon in his hand, and took his hand and the weapon through his lower face, removing his jaw and everything below his eyes. He was absolutely conscious and aware of what had happened, but he now had no jaw, no tongue, and the bottom half of his face had disappeared off in that direction. His name was Ian Page. He's a color sergeant. He's still a color sergeant. He's still alive, and he's still alive because the medic in the back of that vehicle got out and the medic's name was Private Norris got out, climbed up on top of the vehicle because the medic couldn't get up from underneath and went to him and he, Ian Page, had just been shot by a sniper and the medic knew that and went to him and started to clear his airway and save his life the medic was shot through the heel of the boot, didn't touch the skin. Another bullet hit the pack on the medic's back with all the medical supplies in it, didn't touch the medic. Private Norris continued to save the life of Color Sergeant Ian Page. The next bullet took the little handheld walkie-talkie off her belt, her belt. That medic was 18 years old, less than five feet tall. Michelle Norris, because I saw it and I was the commander at the time, received a military cross for her bravery. She saved that man's life under fire and just got on with the job. Now that takes a huge amount of energy. She went to Buckingham Palace. She, was, she received her medal from the Queen. So where did she get that energy? Well, there are four places that I believe we all get energy. One is physical. Only one is physical out of four. So we eat, we sleep, and we exercise and that makes us more energetic. And there are people in this room who are ultra fit. But I believe that's only 25% of the energy that you take with you to your competitions, to your life, to your children, 
to your parenting, to your work. Where else do you get energy from? Let's look at, at the physical side. Everybody always talks about, I must train harder. No, you must rest better. Physicality is about damaging your body through exercise, challenging it, and asking it to adapt. In order to adapt, you must eat properly and sleep properly. If you sleep eight hours, you are half as likely to be injured as the person that, eats, that sleeps for seven hours, who is half as likely again as the person who sleeps for six hours. Lots of science behind this. I'm not going to quote it, but you can look it up. So sleep is the most important part of your fitness. Rest and planning your rest is much more important than planning your training. And I've got a couple of friends here, including a top triathlon coach, who will love me saying this and will then tell me afterwards to act on it. So sleep and rest and nutrition. We all eat the wrong things. And I have become more and more convinced, as many of you will be, that anything processed is bad for me and good for the company that's selling it. So what you eat is a huge part of your energy, my energy, and living to 106. If it says low fat, it's been processed, it's bad for you. If it's in a packet, it's been processed, it's bad for you. Don't cook with vegetable oil. It's bad for you. Those three things, taken as principles, will mean that you have a lot more energy every day from that first point, which is physical. The second point is slightly harder to grasp. And that is that we are all mental beings. And if our head's in the right place, as all the competitors, the successful businessmen, and women in the audience will know, if your head's in the right place, you can achieve great things. But to do that, you must have a focus. The mental side of this is another 25% of your energy is about your focus. It's about knowing where you're going. It's about knowing that you're going to live to 106. It's about knowing that you're going to be the world champion in 2047. It's about knowing that as soon as that 55 year comes round, you're going to be going back to Kona. Knowing that gives you a mental focus. You're now back to selection and maintenance of the aim, that first principle of war. Make sure you choose that aim carefully. Because everything in your life must now be subordinate to that aim. Nothing must get in the way of that aim, whatever it is. In my case, it's a physical, it's a, an athletic aim. But it may not be. It may be to become the CEO of your country country. Aim high. Go for the big ones, because if you have a mediocre aim, you will perform in a mediocre manner. So my second point is that in order to be energetic, to have all that energy, the energy that gets you out of bed just before the alarm goes off, the energy that means you never press the snooze button. Who pressed the snooze button this morning? Anybody? I know you didn't. Pressing the snooze button means that you have an energy deficit. You probably didn't go to bed early enough. You probably haven't rested well enough. Or you may just not have quite enough of that mental focus. Because once that energy kicks in, it's like... It's something illegal. It's an amazing, amazing boost of power that the mental side will give you. Now, that's all very well. The next piece, and I've done two. That's 50% of my energy sorted. 25% of it is physical, 25% of it, I'm looking at the mental focus and your mind. The next 25% is all about your emotional brain. It's about your friends. It's about your colleagues. It's about your family. It's those that support you. There are those in the audience here who've done 11, 12 Ironmen, much more than me. But they will all recognize that when the going gets tough, the principal thing that keeps you going, whether it's a cycle race, CrossFit competition, 
is knowing that you've put yourself out there and your family and friends are supporting you. They are the reason you're going to keep going. You've signed a contract with those family and those friends. And they're the ones that you need to nurture in your life in order to have that energy when you get to that critical moment and things are getting tough. I remember in a, an Ironman in South Africa, I went too hard on the bike, which is a common occurrence with me, and left too little for the run. And as the cramp set in at about 15 kilometers of a 42-kilometer marathon, and my legs started going the wrong way, and I realized there was a problem because my tongue was curling slightly, and I had cramp in my tongue, and I now had cramp in my hands, and my legs gave up completely, and I went to the floor in this little sort of curled up ball. You know what that spider does when you pour the hot tap on it? I was that man, and all these lovely drunk South Africans with beers were going, you right? And I go, yeah, I'm fine. And all I could think of was my friends back in Dubai who were watching the stats on the tracker saying, I think he's in trouble. And so you waited, and I thought about those people, and I waited, and my hands started uncurling, and my tongue started uncurling. And then the pain went out of one leg, and I got up, and I sort of started. And then I felt really, really good, because it all went away, and I started running too fast. And 150 meters later, I'm down doing the spider thing again on the floor, and I've now got my own ambulance. Very nice people. They're asking all the time, are you all right? Do you want to continue? Yes, yes, I know my wife's watching. My wife's watching. I've got to keep going. And this was nothing to do with fitness or mental focus. It was all about relationships. It's all about building that support network that was going to get me to the end. And I got to the end. I didn't qualify that year. It was a bit of a mess. And I've never been sore in my life because, as you all know, once you've had cramp, everything hurts afterwards. But it was relationships. It was about nurturing the support network that would get me from A to B. So the third part of my energy and the art of the possible for me is all about friends, family, all of you, anybody who knows me, anybody who has even an ounce of goodwill towards me. I don't want to let you down in those critical moments. The last point is spirit. Spirit is not, for me, a, a religious thing. I don't believe. I believe in Darwinism. I believe in evolution. But I do believe in doing things right. Now, in the military, 18-year-old Private Norris, four months out of training, had this wonderful spiritual piece that said... I've got to do the right thing. It was her duty. I imagine myself walking into a room. It's a bit of a room like this, actually, in my imagination. And there's a box where all that stuff is. And I walk into the room, and everybody in the room are friends and family. People who've known me. Because I'm dead, and I'm in that box. And they can't see me. And I float around the room listening and I'm listening for what they're saying about me and I really 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 care now as I get older and I'm over halfway maybe by a few days as I get older I care more and more about that legacy and what people will say about me and I don't want them to say he was XYZ but I want none of those buts so when I race when I do business, when I, I conduct my life, I try, and don't get me wrong, remember, those that can't teach, and I'm currently trying to teach, I don't always get it right, but I try to conduct my life now and my races now with that in mind, that they're going to say nice things about me, not that they're going to say, yeah, but he used to cut the corner at the end of that race, didn't he? He always used to cut the corner. He just took a little advantage there. Or he used to draft behind that bike. Every time you could see him drafting. I don't want them to say that. I want them to be saying, he raced fair. He 
he conducted his life within that moral compass. And if I can say that, and I'm trying, I'm not very good at it, I cock it up most days at some point, but if I can do that, I get a whole load of new energy, the, the last 25%. So when it comes to the art of the possible, for me, despite being an athlete of the future, it's not about body. It's about body, mind, emotion, and spirit. Now, I wasn't a particularly brave bloke in Iraq. Oh, we don't want this. We don't want that. We want that. I wasn't particularly brave. I used to sit in one of these. On this side, where the bloke's sitting up on top posing, it's not me. I wouldn't pose. There's another fella down here. He's the driver. This fella up here normally stands inside the turret on this side. And there's a, another chap. He's an unsung hero who sits down in the front. Now, I'm sitting there as the commander in my tank. I've got a, a fella here. His name was Nemo. Nemo's an interesting guy. Nemo was a young lad, very, very good at his job, very good at PlayStation, etc., which meant he's very good at firing a tank. Very similar, lots of electronics. But Nemo went out one night, and he got a tattoo. His real name was Owen. Had it on his arm, known as Nemo for the rest of his life. Yep, he got it tattooed on his arm, Owen. So Nemo is my my gunner. He's a fantastic fella. And on my left is a young captain, because at the time I was commanding something called a battle group, which is about 1,400 men, women, brave medics, etc. And down in the front is a chap called Trooper Chance. Chance is 19 years old and a regimental footballer in a regiment that prides itself on its football team, on its soccer team. He's a very fit man. And we're in a gunfight, a big battle. And we're being fired at by mortars that you chuck up in the air and they come down on your head and make a big bang, by snipers and by rocket-propelled grenades. You've all heard of an RPG, probably, or a rocket attack. But I'm in a tank. It's the biggest, baddest tank in the world. It's 70 tons. The armor is about this thick at the front, from there to there. And every now and again, there's a clunk on the outside of the tank as a bullet hits it, and you hear it as if somebody's hit the tank with a hammer. And every now and again, because you have to stay up, you have to smell, you have to listen, you have to feel, so you don't keep your head down. Well, I do. I keep it very, very low indeed, with just my eyes sticking out from the top of the tank at about here. There's a big bang as we're hit from the front by an RPG. It's a big bang. It's fine. And the ball of flame rolls over the top. I duck my head. No problem. A few hairs less on my arms. A slight smell of those hairs burning. You know, you've caught them in a candle before. You know what that smell is. And then your head's back up. And then there's a voice. Because we're all connected with headsets on to each other in the tank. And the voice said, Sir, I'm hit. I said, who's that? Is that you, Chance? Don't be stupid. He's behind all this armor at the front. He's got a, a periscope. So he's looking through a mirror upwards to another mirror. We've had this before. When a bullet strikes that upward mirror, the brain of the poor chap looking through the periscope sees the bullet at 700 meters per second, and it hits him between the eyes. The immediate reaction is your head gets thrown back, and your brain says, I've just been shot between the eyes. I'm going to die. Of course, you then realize that you're just being stupid because all you've got is a bit of broken glass above you and you're absolutely fine. Your brain has given you a trick. So I thought this is what had happened. So two per chance, don't be stupid. No, sir. Now I can smell burning. I can smell pork crackling and blood. This stuff on the front is very secret. It's called explosive reactive armor. I won't tell you how it works because somebody would have to come and shoot me. 
But basically, it's there to protect the armor from the RPG warhead. An RPG warhead is a shaped charge. It, it fires off something called an EFP, an explosively formed projectile. And it's molten metal that actually penetrates the armor. And that slug of molten metal is traveling at 8,000 to 10,000 meters per second, or 15 times the speed of that high-velocity bullet that we were talking about. And when it hits the armor, something called hydrodynamic separation takes place, and both, basically the armor, this thickness of metal here, becomes liquid. Because this thing is traveling so fast with so much energy that it liquefies everything in front of it. And what had happened here was that there are these gaps between the boxes of explosive reactive, very secret armor. And it had hit a gap. The explosive reactive armor hadn't worked, and this slug of metal traveling 8,000 to 10,000 meters per second penetrated the driver's compartment. Now, he's down there about 10 feet, 8 feet away from me in this huge tank where we are totally safe. And he says, sir, I've been hit. It's my leg. I said, what do you mean, Chance? You can't have been hit. He said, I have. It's a bit smoky down here. I've looked once. It's definitely gone. He had lost his leg. That slug had penetrated. And as he sat there, in his position, with his periscope, the jet had passed through his leg, taking the leg off at the knee, leaving his calf and his boot separate to the rest of his body. Now, I'm in the front line, trying to protect another vehicle behind me that is bogged, and they're trying to get that out. And we're now static, because he has to keep on moving the tank, otherwise, just like a ship on the rocks... It'll just get battered to death by the waves. In this case, the waves of incoming nastiness. Trooper Chance, age 19, goes quiet. Shock is what kills somebody in this case normally. Shock and blood loss. And I thought he must have passed out. And then he came back and he said, I think I fixed it. I looked across at my operator and we shook it our heads at each other and said if he's lost his leg he's lost his leg you know he is going to die and he's going to die down there and we can't get to him because if you come out you get shot you can't get down through to him so what are we going to do he said i've got my belt sir i think i've stopped it i've tied it off well i was shocked i'm busy trying to work out how we're going to get out of there because now that they've seen they've, they've got us the intensity of the fire is increasing and the thing is starting to fall apart. A few seconds later, he says, Right, boss, what are we going to do? I said, I, um, uh, Yeah, uh, no idea, because I was in a blind funk. And he said, uh, It's not a problem, boss. I can drive. Using his good leg, it's an automatic. Using his good leg, he drove us back 1,500 meters out of the danger zone. We got a helicopter in. We took him out. He's now got a brilliant job. I'll tell you about that later. He doesn't play football anymore. We put somebody else in the seat, which wasn't popular because we didn't take Trooper Chance's leg out. So the poor chap who got in the seat shared it with Trooper Chance's leg and drove back in and we finished the, the job. Trooper Chance is now doing film support as an amputee so when you watch one of those great films fury or you know one of these war films and you see all those blokes who've been blown up and you think god that's good cgi look he hasn't got a leg that's true of chance okay because he knows exactly what it's like and he's a great actor and he's making a lot of money out of being legless but the point here for both of these people is that when we're under stress we go to that monkey brain, the hypothalamus and the thalamus, right in the center of our brains, and we lose track of the frontal cortex, which is all about your memories, your experience, your decision-making. And we lose the bit at the back, which is all about emotion, 
and that support that I was mentioning and talking about. And we end up with fight or flight because we are but animals. As I said, I'm into evolu evolution. I believe in us being animals. And if you go back to that monkey brain, then you're not going to make good decisions. But both of these young people, one a female of about this high, and Trooper Chance, a very fit, very athletic, very capable young soldier, 19 years old, with one leg, never went to that monkey brain under stress. This is your emotions. All this is decision making. Somewhere in here is the hypothalamus. It's about the size of a conquer or a small plum. So you lose all that big brain and you end up with a little brain and you make bad decisions. And you make those decisions at work. You make those decisions during a race. And if you suffer from stress and you don't get used to this and you're not fit enough, or you don't exercise all those other sources of energy, you're going to make bad decisions. If he, Trooper Chance, had gone to the hypothalamus, I wouldn't be here now and I wouldn't be thinking I'm going to be 106 years old when I die because I would have stayed there. Saved my life. He saved Nemo's life. He saved my operator's life. Because he was fit enough, because he knew his duty, that was him living within his spirit. He was best mates with Nemo. He wasn't going to let Nemo down. I don't think he cared a fig about me, but it doesn't matter. He was best mates with Nemo, and he knew Nemo was going to die if he didn't stay with it. So, four parts. Four pieces that you go away from here with, hopefully, if I'm teaching. And four things that, because when you teach, you get better at it, I'm going to try and do from here on in. I'm going to get the physical side right with lots of rest and lots of the right nutrition. I'm going to get my focus right. And you've heard how often I enunciate it. I banged on to poor old Marcus about this. I'm going to make sure that Caroline, my beautiful wife of 25 years, and my children are behind me in this endeavor and want me to succeed. And I'm going to give back as much as I can so that they can see that there is balance in my life that isn't just Iron Man. And I'm going to try to live my life so that when I come back and look at the bloke in the box and all those friends are around it, they're saying the right thing. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you very much. Questions? Straight away. Hi, um, I'm Fleur, also from a military background in the Australian Army. Um, something that really interests me when you talk about the mental strength, um, being a parent, having children myself, you know, it's not working? No. Go again? <laughs> Um, what you said about the mental strength, having, coming from a military and sporting background, a lot of people get that. But as a parent, I see that children ne aren't necessarily given those opportunities from a young age. What do you think, you know, I know Marcus runs some amazing programs and it's very much based on that mental strength. What else do you think we can do as parents to instill that from an earlier age? Success is about two things, ability, and all our kids have it in potential terms, and opportunity. And all we can do is what my parents gave me, every opportunity to do everything. And that's why so many of you, the mums in the room, will, will recognize the, the ferrying them about. That is the biggest investment we can make in our children, to give them that, that, that opportunity. And they may well find, because all of us in this room are probably potential world champions at something. But we never found exactly what that was. Now, I think I found mine. It's a bit late, but I'll, I found mine. I'm going to try for it. Okay, but we need to give them that opportunity. It's not about ability. It's about ability coupled with opportunity. And that's where our children will be successful. I know that you're doing that for yours. But there are many of us who say, oh, I'm going to make him concentrate on triathlon. But actually, all the greatest triathletes... We're all multi-sporters of a hundred different sports in school, etc. 
And they didn't actually focus in until, well, certainly an Iron Man, until they're in their thirties, some of them, before they decided they were going to be triathletes. So I think it's it's opportunity, and we can give them opportunity. Schools are not responsible for giving our children opportunity, no matter how much we pay them. And I can say this now because my children have grown up. But I think I gave them as much opportunity as I could, and I hope that you all will. Is that is that fair? Mental toughness wise, I'm afraid I, I my my daughter's a my daughter's a model. I've spent my whole life telling her, You're not pretty, Mimi. You're fat, Mimi. I'm not a very good parent by most people's and but you know what? I did it with love in my heart because I didn't want her to become look at me. Well she has come a bit look at me, but she's supposed to be look at me now. But the bottom line was she worked really, really hard because every time she said, Who's prettier, me or mummy? didn't matter what she was. Mummy's prettier than you and always going to be. So I'm afraid I was brutal and many people will criticize my parenting from that point of view. But luckily for me, she didn't end up with an eating disorder. She could well have done, but she didn't. So mental toughness, I think we have to be cruel to be kind. I, I saw a, um, a gentleman in the officers club in Abu Dhabi six years ago. He was sitting with his son. The son was between 10 and 12 years old. The skin on his rather obese body had folded over to form a fold down over his ankles. He was sitting next to his father who had just bought him breakfast, two of the biggest chocolate muffins, biggest chocolate muffins, about the size of that bucket. And that was his breakfast. That child, if nothing has happened since then, will now be in the last five years of his life. He's not going to make 20. His father killed him so I think you've got to be cruel to be kind and if we can instill in our children that you get your energy from four places not just playstation then that's probably a good thing David at the start you mentioned about nutrition um, how is your diet changed over the last say four or five years and in particular what's your view on the I guess paleo versus vegetarianism versus you know other diets it's almost as if they've planted you thank you thank you thank you good okay I'm on I'm on a hobby horse here with about 12 minutes left I'll be two minutes on this one um I'm absolutely certain and there are people in this room who live and breathe the high fat low carb diet I'm absolutely certain that it is streets ahead of the low-fat, high-carb diet that the Western world has been playing with for the last 30 years. What have I changed? I've stopped taking sugar in my coffee. That was eight kilos, just like that. Eight kilos off my rugby-playing body by giving up sugar in my coffee and drinking it, giving up fat, fat-creating fizzy drinks. Sugar is the number one change. If you can cut sugar out, and don't forget there's sugar in everything. You buy the low-fat milk, it's got added sugar to make it taste nicer. Ooh! By the fat, full fat milk, it's less processed. The full fat cream, great, it's less processed. So sugar was the one thing that I, I changed. Then, then I've tried to cut down on bread, pasta, and rice, all sugars. Alcohol was out of my system by about 31, but you know I, I'd lost whole weeks by then, so um, it had to go very early on. But alcohol, guys, is sugar, so. I, I tell people, I don't know how scientific this is, but I, I feel it's right, that if you have one brunch a month, we can probably help you train to get fitter. If you have two, we're not going to manage to get you fitter. If you have three or four, you're on a downward spiral, and there's nothing you can do by coming, coming to me, my gym, or my therapists, nothing at all. If you're on four brunches a month, you're on your way, not just through the Dubai Stone, which will happen in about two weeks, um, but you're on your way to an early death. And what we can say categorically is that weight, extra weight carried around is years off your life. So when we have a huge success story, and Luke has a huge success story, who did a, an Ironman, he did, did um, Bolton this year, having lost, I think it's 40 kilos or is it 20? 40 kilos. We can say categorically that that man will live for 25 years longer than he would have done. 25 years. Just think if you went on holiday 
and you said, right, I'm going to have six months holiday doing everything I want to do in life, how much would you pay? I'd pay 40,000 dirhams, six months, no, 100,000 dirhams for six months holiday. And yet we're saying to people that we can give you 20 years. What price does that come at? We've got to cut down on the weight, guys. I believe the 400-year-old man has been born. That's another story. Good enough. Um, I'm talking about as you get older, obviously, um, how do you sort of uh, maintain the sort of uh, preventing injuries, basically? So what do you do within your... This comes back to planning a rest. We all get very fixated. I watched some awesome athletes this morning. I arrived about half an hour early. There were people doing muscle-ups. Well, I then put my hands on these rings. Nope, not going to go near that in this company. Exercise seems to be the nirvana that we all think will solve the problem that will cause you injuries especially as we get older we are more likely to injure but if we can get the rest right then we can reduce that injury risk by a a factor of 10 so rest is the most important thing especially as you get older a little bit of strength training and make them big compound moves. The sort of gym this is, is all about compound moves. It's all about the stabilizing muscles. I go into an old gym and you see that preacher curl machine. Look at those biceps. Yep, they're great. Yep, I'm doing well. No supporting muscles being used. No stabilization. No balance. So movement is key as you get older. Yoga, fantastic. Pilates, brilliant. Look up Ido Portal on, um, on, uh, on Instagram. Watch how he moves. That's what we need to do. Move more. Now, we're all <sighs> products of the 20th century, sitting in our cars, leaning forward, playing with the computer, watching television, driving the car again, riding our bikes. It's all gone forwards. Stand up. Move. Get out of the desk. If you're, if you're working and make sure you get your shoulders back, twist, keep moving. And then we can, we can defy age. Absolutely. We can go on for years and years and years. I'm going to. Um, are there any of your, I guess, close competitors over the years who have had a really different approach to training or eating or anything to you, but, but still have achieved great results? Oh, I'm in trouble here. There's one bloke who I can't beat. And if he goes to my races, I go, oh, bloody hell. His name's Jürgen Zak. He's a fantastic cyclist. He was, the sec he was second in Kona in 2006. Yeah, he had a different approach. He failed his A sample in 2006 and was given the option of we test your B sample or you retire. He retired. He's now back in my age group at 50. And he beats me every time. Now, I don't know whether that's, that's unfair of me, but he definitely had a different approach. And I don't think he got his last 25% from his ethical stance. Is there anyone with an ethical stance who has a different approach? Uh, yeah, hundreds. I think mine is, is developing. The more I talk about it, the more I believe in what I'm saying, and the more it makes sense to me. Now, you've heard this for the first time, and you will judge me on hearing it for the first time. If it makes sense, you'll take something of this forward into your lives. If it doesn't make sense, then don't do it, because it only works for me. We are all individuals. There are lots of people who do it very differently to the way I do it. There are lots of people who, who put sport before family, or they put work before family. And I've got to 52 and realized that that didn't make me happy. I certainly did it in the past, putting work before family. Nobody in that box said as their last words, oh, I wish I'd spent more time in the office. So I think we do have to get that balance in life, and it is about balance and agility, not phys physical agility, but the agility to use the 24 hours of the day in the best possible way and to plan your day and make sure that you have some sort of a plan rather than just going through life and seeing what it, it does to you. 
much better to go through life and do something to your life going forward. You can't change what's behind, but you can change what's in front of you. Is that is that fair? I don't, don't think I answered the question, but I said something I wanted to say. David, I have a question for you. The two things that have been a massive part of your life are quite inherently selfish. Being in the forces, you've been away for a long period of time, and everything you've spoken about, family, support network, you're almost putting them in a really tricky position. You've then moved into a sport which you've obviously done very well at, which takes hours and hours of commitment and time. Most of the time you're on your own. How do you balance the two, the absolute self-centeredness that it takes to be successful with what you spoke about as a support network? I think you have to give back. And now I'm, I'm not always good at this, but I made a commitment about a year ago. I actually came to a small epiphany and I realized that I was taking my wife for granted. She had put up with me for 24 years at that point. And I th- things have changed. My aims haven't changed, but I've realized that in order to continue to enjoy her support, I need to give back. I'm still being selfish. I'm doing this because my selection and maintenance of the aim, nothing else must get in the way. But in order to achieve that aim, I've realized that I've got to spend a lot more time making sure that I support her aims. And I'm very lucky she's turned to sport. She now runs and wins cups and stuff. And I support those, and I go and run with her. And, you know, rather than be totally selfish, which we've all done. Oh, no, sorry, darling, can't run with you. I've got to do, you know, 50 minutes in zone three. So I can't possibly run with you because your, your zone, zone 17 is my zone three, so I'm not coming with you. And now I, I subordinate that, and it might mean that I don't get as fit as I could by that little bit but you know what I've got that other 25% being shored up and she is happy and I'm now her support network and this is not something of a win-lose this is a win-win this is not a zero-sum game we can all benefit so we can support those people that are going to say nice things about us when we leave and I think I'm getting more towards that so thank you very much for the reminder and the warning but I think I've moved towards that. I'm still not. Uh, I'm a long way from perfect. There's a second part to the question. If today was your last day, what would you do with it? Sit in the coffee shop, hopefully with somebody who wants to listen to me, and hopefully change their life just a little bit. And let them live a little bit longer. Because happiness is not about money. It's, uh, I, I, I've had good, well-paying jobs. But now I'm realizing that happiness is going to work and seeing somebody else's smile. It's awesome. It's just, it's, it's, it's mega. And that would make my last day happy if somebody went away saying, David, I'm going to do that. Amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge, huge round of applause for David. Absolutely fantastic. Thanks again, mate. Of course, because of his background, we're exactly on time. Thank you again for coming. Look out for the next Inner Talks. It's going to be back to the original format that we used. We're going to take about six ladies who are going to share about six minutes of their life each. It'll be at the end of November or the start of December. It's a funny weekend, that one. Thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the balls. And thank you to David. Amazing. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot for tuning in to the show, guys, and geez, so much cool stuff there from David Inner Talks 13. Remember, Inner Talks is an event that runs here at Inner Fight every month. Have a look out for that. It is coming again soon. As I mentioned there, a ladies one. Not ladies only in the audience, but ladies only speaking. They'll be speaking for six minutes at once. So come and check them out. Of course, hop over, rate the podcast. As we say, leave a review. Smith Street Power will send you a goodie bag of treats. Definitely worth doing. If you have something for the podcast, drop us an email, winning at innerfight.com. Thanks a lot for listening. Until next time, take care.